Happy Wednesday, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to this week's edition of the Hump Day Hiatus. Um, we are going to be chatting today a little bit about October's core element of a body trust practice, which is all about reconnecting with our body's needs and boundaries. And to help us dive into that a little bit more, we have my wonderful and dear friend and colleague, Nicole Eikenberry. She's coming at us from Minneapolis, St. Paul. You say Minneapolis, St. Paul? Both, man. Okay. I'm living in St. Paul. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what it means. I feel like it's kind of like Kitchener Waterloo, where it's the same yeah. city, but just has a weird divider line that no one can see or knows where it is. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're going to be chatting a little bit with Nicole. So she um, brings to the table a background in uh, dietetics. So she's a registered dietitian. She is also a certified intuitive eating counselor and also um, a fellow certified body trust practitioner with myself. We were in the same training together. Uh, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I love being here. And <laughs> I think it's funny. So do you have a bleep button in case? No, like, we don't okay. have a bleep button. So and there's no like editing or anything. So we're just, it's like I'm in your living room and we're having yeah. a conversation. I love it. Exactly. <laughs> we are putting it all out there. And uh People who know me and, and follow me know that I curse and I'm kind of unapologetic about that. So actually, funny enough, there was a thing that I saw on Facebook the other day that um, Hillary posted. Did you see that? I shared it many times. Yes. With it's like, the research shows that it's a good thing for you to be friends with people who swear. I was like, got it. I'm nailing this friendship thing. <laughs> Although I do like to challenge myself to be a little bit more creative sometimes. Same. Yeah. Yeah. I'm totally with you. Um, okay. So let's, uh, let's dive in here. So we'll, we'll start because I always like um, hearing a little bit of um, people's backstories, especially mm -hmm. I always find I learned something new as well about those that I already know. So how, um, how did you get into doing this work? Mm -hmm. Um, and what, uh, what makes you passionate about it? All right. Um, I have been a dietitian now, registered dietitian for just over 20 years. And I'm, I don't consider myself a typical dietitian. Um, and I also didn't enter the field in a typical way. I actually first studied geography and I was more interested sort of in food systems and, um, you know, and agriculture and how are we going to feed the nine, 10 billion and um, sustainability and biodiversity and sort of my dream job would be to go to some um, you know, I love cultural geography. And so I wanted to like go to some rural area and tell the land and what was missing from their diet and be able to grow that food. And, and so it's just a very different um, way of getting into nutrition. Of course, I did suffer through all of the training and learned a lot. And also did get a master's degree in nutrition after I had worked at a hospital for a while working with um, inpatient and outpatient. And in my outpatient experience, got to work one-on-one -on -one with clients who were um, sent to me, uh, mm -hmm. me for various diets. And that's back in the days when we wore the white coats and had the calculator in the pocket. <laughs> and, you know get the 24-hour recall and basically, you know, calculate and this is what you need and here you go. And then, you know, are they going to be compliant or not? And right. I just, it just did it. You know, I actually, I started noticing that my clients were mostly, um, you know, a lot of working moms and just stressed out. And when I started asking them about their lives, finding out that, hey, you know, invariably, I was bringing out the tissue box and finding, right. I really, really sunk in that there was a big difference between um, psychological hunger and physiological hunger and the ways that we, you know, interacted with food and our relationship with food. So that was 20 years ago. And then um, through my 
meditation practice and then my yoga practice um, informed a lot of coming here and getting back into the workforce after being a mom who got to do a lot of gardening and cooking for my family for quite a while um, and riding my bike. Um, I have come into this and finding the, the body trust. I mean, it just absolutely has spoken to me. It is just so true in every bone and cell of my body. And so it's like, finally, now I can say, this is exactly what I want to do when I grow up, yeah. <laughs> you know, sure. after years. So, yeah. And I find, you know, so actually, well, I mean, I'll go out on a limb here and say, I think pretty much all of us who have um, been drawn to and found the path um, to body trust or the body trust path have had a ton of life experience within a system of um, healthcare or healing that is extremely prescriptive mm -hmm. and really kind of doesn't allow space for an individual's lived experience or wisdom to um, enter into the conversation about, you know, what what is most supportive for you right now? It's, you know, kind of more like, here's what you need right now, according to the system. And it doesn't really matter what you're coping with, where you're at, and that sort of thing. So that's, yeah. That to feel like some external, some expert, some system knows better what is good for me than I do for myself. And you start to lose trust in your own knowing. You know, like we're all, we're all mammals. We're all human beings. We've been programmed a certain way and we start to lose trust in that and, and seek it from some external. Absolutely. And then it's, are we, are we doing it right? And are we, you know, meeting the expectation of this external um, expert, this should. Yes. Should. Yeah, totally. I've been contemplating this a ton lately, and I know we we had a little pre-chat um, as you and I got to share in a beautiful experience of of learning with um, one of our favorite humans, Lucy Aframar. I know. Yeah, we just need to take a little pause for Lucy there. <laughs> and um really had an opportunity to dive into something I know is near and dear to your heart and the work that you're doing now, which are all of our ways of knowing. Yes. Yes. That was so mind blowing and um, really changed the way I approach so much of this. Yes. That whole experience. And I, I would love to get into that. Yeah. Um, like right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is, I mean, this is a really big topic. I just want to say like, just to, to get started. And um, I love being able to do the body trust work as a dietitian. I mean, there have been many moments and perhaps years that I was actually embarrassed of like uh, my profession, right. Of, of being a dietitian because there was so much um, that I didn't um, groove with. But here now in my practice, people come to me because they're having issues with food, right? And then really food becomes this doorway into so much and so much of the whole body trust, which is just so much bigger than your relationship with food, right? And yeah. so, so, you know, this is such a big topic, like that whole, the, the reconnecting with bodies, needs and boundaries. And I think one of the first things that I do with clients, and I am getting to your question here, one of the first things is for clients to be able to recognize that indeed I have needs, right? Yes. Not only do I have needs to be able to kind of determine what those are and then that they're actually worthy of having those needs met which is a totally different thing than even being able to recognize perhaps what your needs are. Yeah. Totally. So in this process, you know, well, like, how do you do that? You know, what is the approach? And I have like 
a certain approach that I generally do. Of course, every client is very individual completely, which I love. And um, one of those things is to get to be attuned to what our needs are. And the majority of my clients are coming to me with a history of, of dieting and a history of trusting somebody outside of themselves that they know better than what they know for themselves. In fact, a lot of people just like completely have lost touch with their sort of inner wisdom and they do not trust. They, they perhaps um, have a lot of shame about their body and feel um, almost betrayed by their body, I think. That's exactly what I was going to say. And so there, there's this, this, um, this, desire to flee the body and to go to some external that they think might know better because surely they don't because look at how wrong they are. Right. Because right. their body is yeah. not showing up in society, in the world, the way that we're told our bodies are supposed to be or even our behaviors, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So there is sort of like this three prong approach that I take where we look at acceptance, which is really looking at what is the societal, like lifting the veil on what is going on, who determines what we're supposed to be doing, who's benefiting from that? How does that, how does that work with me? Um, you know, a lot of exploration of both personally, like your history, um, like maybe your body image history and looking to see how you've been socialized and that how often we give up ourselves in service to somebody else, right? And then, um, so there's accept, there's attunement, which is really getting into our internal, um, being able to hear, I love the quote that Rumi says, he says, um, there's a voice that, um, there's a voice that doesn't use words, listen, right? And so those are oftentimes the messages coming from our body. And we have to learn to tune into that. Um, and so that attunement process is a lot of it is getting below the story in our head and actually getting right. into our bodies. The last, and I'll get more into that because this is where the ways of knowing comes. And then the last, the third prong is honor. So we've got accept, attune, and honor. And honoring is that, that we are worthy of having these met, needs met. You know, once we are able to actually determine what our needs are, it's a whole nother ball game yeah. to honor that, right? Yeah. And so that's where, you know, a lot of times we work on the skills of acceptance and attunement. And a lot of times I just sort of have to hold that honoring for people mm -hmm. that I have to hold for them that they are worthy until they're able to catch up with that, you know? Yeah. So that's always there. But then with that attunement process, this gets into, um, Lucy's ways of knowing, right? Yeah. So I can describe um, like a three-legged stool. So yeah. we have this external, you know, the silo or the leg of the stool that is academia, that is the experts, that are the research studies, that are, you know, Log not that are. What did you say? Logic. Yes. Well, yeah. perhaps. Um, it's certainly an institutional sort of logic. Okay. Yes. Okay. You know, so that is our socialization. It's the it's all these shoulds that we should be doing these externals, right? And then we have our intuitive um, sense. You know that inner wisdom that we have that's programmed into us, just like squirrels are programmed to hunt for nuts and do you know do the squirrel things. We as humans are programmed to know what our to know what our needs are. So. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of uh, skills that we use to build that. Um, and then the third leg of the stool is that experiential or practical knowledge, that ability to say, I, I know from experience that this is true for me, or this works, this doesn't. And when we look at the external, our internal, and our practical or experiential ways of knowing, can we bring those all to the same level? Right. Bringing up our intuitive knowledge and perhaps decreasing a little bit that external knowledge and bringing those into balance. You know, we are informed by some externals, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't override what our internal is or our practical experiential knowledge. Yeah. I kind of, I, the way that I kind of, um, 
worked with that a little bit personally and, and with my clients is allowing that knowledge and that information, right? Those, those learned pieces from the external help to enrich and, um, and inform my awareness a little bit of what's going on inside of me, right? So I can name things and, yes. and you know, I can, like with gentle nutrition, right? We can say, oh, okay, so within these, you know, nutrients, I know that if I have these two, I have energy for X amount of hours. Mm -hmm. Instead of the other way around with saying, you know, like, well, I'm told that I need these, so I'm going to eat them. Right. And then you're able to, with your experiential knowledge, either verify or falsify yes. that information. And that that is just as valid as some external knowledge. Is yes. that for me? Which is very different because we get this sort of dissonance when somebody is saying, this is true for you. You should be able to do this. You should do this. And when that's not our lived experience, yeah, what happen is we feel like we're wrong. Yeah, we doubt ourselves, right? Yeah. Instead of the outside information. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if that outside information is biased or has some agenda, like purchase my product, right? Like the whole diet industrial complex. Yes. Right. And oh. so when we say we're wrong, what then tends to happen is that buildup of, of shame. Mm -hmm. Right. We, we feel wrong. We feel we're broken. We feel we're not OK. And then hence we go down the road of fixing. Yeah. And, and when we can learn to trust that indeed my experience is true and valid, then we can sort of let go a little bit of, yeah, that's a little whack out there or that part is true for me that part isn't true for me and she will accept yeah there's like a discernment that's able to happen one of my favorite yeah. words yeah. yeah so i'm if it's okay with you i just want to kind of back it up a little bit um because one of the one of the pieces of this that a friend helped me articulate the other day um, who's in academia. And I absolutely love having conversations with her because she helps me bring a whole new language to some of this stuff that I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. How do I say that? What is, I, this is how I'm feeling. And this is the situations that I'm feeling it in. And she's like, oh, it's this. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, one of the things that we were chatting about the other day was, um, you know, the start of this process of coming back to your body mm -hmm. and trusting your body, being in a relationship with yourself that's rooted in kindness and compassion, as opposed to, you know, this, this mainstream kind of mentality that's out there right now that's all about controlling your body and, you know, almost, almost seeking, um, virtue in the fact that we can override our body's needs, right? We can push through them. We can ignore them. You know, it's like this superhuman power. Humanness. Yes. yes. Yes, totally. That was what you said. And I love that. And, you know, one of the things that she said, like the first part of coming back into this type of natural, innate, and more instinctual and intuitive relationship with yourself is recognizing the ideologies that you're living within. Yeah. Right. So recognizing the systems yes. that you're operating in that may not be supporting you. Right. Right. Because I find so many of us are kind of roaming around right now feeling like just completely um defeated right there's so many things going on there's so much that we have to do and we can't possibly keep up with it all right but there what's the alternative right right and so recognizing that we live within these systems that are meant to keep us hustling i think is really for me one of the most important first steps right and right. that's part of that acceptance. That's part yes. of that revealing 
this is the society that we live in. There are certain oppressions in place. There are certain things that I have, you know, internalized of this external system. And to be able to look at it all with, um, with kindness and curiosity, right? Which is the mindfulness aspect that is the number one thing that I really start with, with my clients. I mean, it's, it's mindful, food in motion, right? And so using that as a tool to be able to look at all of this without like having it like, without feeling so um, like a failure or without feeling so much, um, you know, how, when you were talking, it just felt like a real loss of hope. Like, mm -hmm. totally. Right? Um, so to be able to look at it with mindfulness, so I love, I always use this, um, Elise, um, Evelyn and Elise in the intuitive eating training, they talk about like the golfer voice. And so I'm not a golfer, but if you've seen golf on TV, it's that she's approaching the cabinet. She's not hungry. It's that <laughs> neutral observer's voice, right? Yes. It's observing what's happening moment to moment, but without that judgment or criticality that we normally, I don't know if that's a word, criticality. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going with it. <laughs> that we normally have but with um that more that spice of curiosity which is a receptive frame of mind that we can get information mm -hmm. with that curiosity and we can look and we can create a little bit of space and we can say oh look at that isn't that interesting that's the p word patriarchy in play or that's you know that's my desire to look a certain way for acceptance right you know, that's you know xyz of of what we're taught from the outside and to be able to look at that and say that's interesting where does that come from how does that play out like and be yeah. curious about that and so, so that piece. yeah so curiosity is really a core piece of or approaching things with curiosity is really also a core piece of that acceptance right because it takes you out of judgment right. takes you out of the stories that you're telling yourself about you know, your, your life, your surroundings and allows you to see them as they are. Yes. And to yes. say, yep, that too. Yep. That's part of it too. And, and I, there's space for that too. Yeah. So I know we have like the worthiness piece, which is, which is huge, you know, and I, I know from a personal perspective that I spent quite a long time in a space of being aware and practicing curiosity um, and attuning. And yet there was still this piece of me that was like, I'm not doing that yet. I'm not, no, I'm not going there. I'm still, you know, gonna do the same behaviors that I've been doing all along. Um, I'm not changing, I don't want to. And, you know, it really was not putting those shoulds on myself yeah. that I feel actually created the space for me to one day just go, I think I'm going to do something different. Right. And to do it because maybe you want to yeah. instead of I should. It's like maybe because my internal compass is telling me to go down this route. Yeah. Because you're being more informed by your internal rather than that external, which I mean, I love I love a good rebel, right? Like I love rebellion. But when we're <laughs> rebelling against things, when we're rebelling against that should, those shoulds, that, you know, that's not helpful always either because that's a reactionary type behavior. So yes, to be totally. at that and say, mm, I'll take that piece, I'll leave that piece, I'll take, because this is what I want. And yeah. that, and perhaps it's in line with your values, which is something that you were talking about in introducing this month and that, in yeah. the topic that you did. This is in line with my values and therefore I want to do this. Yeah. So something, so I wonder like if it would be helpful for folks, um, you know, so we've got this um, awareness piece. So in helping to cultivate that, um, you know, is it helpful to write out what your values are? Oh, I absolutely. Yeah. 
So yes. And look at whether or not the things that you're doing are supportive of those um, or are, you know, hindering your, your experience of those, which neither, you know, isn't a good or we don't have to put a value judgment on it, right? Just an observation, you know, what are, what are we doing? Are, are these things in line with my values, which um, directly relate to your needs and your boundaries, which honor your needs? Yes. And right. I actually just did this with a client on Monday. I was like, what is, what are your values, right? Um, you know, this was after you were talking about, we compliment what we value, right? And she was talking about how she compliments her daughter all the time. You're so adorable. You're so cute. You're all, you know, and the question is really, what do you value? And when she listed off, you know, the things that she values, I was like, isn't that interesting? You know, none of what you talked about has anything to do with body or weight. Right. Isn't that interesting? It has nothing to do with appearance. So those things that we value, like, um, you know, I value some of the same things that you've said, you know, integrity, um, connection, uh, um, authenticity, right? I think yeah. we share those values. I would say adventure, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I value adventure. That is like one thing. But I also know that if I'm doing something tedious that I have to get done, you know, I'm not always in adventure mode. I don't always do it. I think sometimes having to do tedious things or chores or something like that. But that doesn't mean that I don't still value adventure. So I think that working from a, a value point is more flexible than having these rigid rules. Like I must. Yes, that's such a good point. Mm -hmm. Yes, it allows for flexibility, which which yeah. you and I both, um, I think, value as well. Yeah, I mean that is flexibility is so important in all of this work, yeah. and and to um, shed the rigidity and shed mm -hmm. that. So. Yeah, the, I think the values are really important to keep front and center. And then the values that we have about life, we can sometimes actually put that toward, you know, if there's eating behaviors that are rigid or eating behaviors that are um, problematic, what do you value about food, right? So a lot of times people value things like um, uh, that it's convenient, right? Mm -hmm. People value... Um, uh, cost in food right. or nutrition. That's absolutely something yeah. or how it's prepared um, or flavor, right? That's something I value. And I, and that goes with adventure for me. I really like that idea of, of being able to try different values, different yeah. flavors, different cultural flavors, different things like that. And then, um, you know, things like nutrition, I honor that too. I value that. And how does that all work together um, in our food choices and mm -hmm. to allow some then flexibility in our food choices too, all as sort of like, I prefer foods that are right. fine, in line with my values. It doesn't always happen, but that's what I prefer. So yeah. I think that helps with people to sort of ease off a little bit on that rigidity to really focus on really what is important. Is it is it towing the line of some, you know, rule thing that I can say I'm doing it right or not? Or is it living in line with your internal compass and saying yeah. this is what is important to me and this is what I actually choose to do? And when you can trust what you choose to do is, is true, then you can do it unapologetically. And then you throw some bravery in there and you can do it fiercely even, you know? Yeah. I'm... I think that's so, um, it's so important to note, I think just exactly as you did that, you know, this in, in, in a nutshell, you know, this, this, this healing, this work, this relationship that we're talking about cultivating with ourselves is not what you're going to be supported to do by a lot of outside sources, right? Because we live in a world where um, money, right, is very much valued and, and is 
the 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 currency that we use to ex, you know to express to experience success quote on success right and I think that um, more and more people are looking towards moving to other different ways of valuing things but it's very much still counterculture and so it's not it's it's not it's not easy to do like there's a lot of resistance out there um and i think you know that's why for for both of us it's so important to have a community around this work because you can't you can't do it alone right right you can't see like here's how the world's telling me to do things and i want to do it differently i'm going at this by myself right there's there's so much value in a collective yeah yeah totally i so completely agree that is that's one of the things i'm really working on building here in the twin cities is sort of more community about this and um christy you're awesome i see that note um oh there's just so much here it's hard to <laughs> yeah the com the community piece and and so often like we it's so human of us to want to connect and to fit in right and and we tr and to conform is sometimes a value of our society right but it's like i don't know i don't do i re is really normality or conforming a value of mine not really but um, it's hard to do that if you feel like you're going to be shunned from a group, right? Absolutely. So we we lose sometimes. We cut off our authentic selves in order to fit in. And this, you know, Brené Brown talks about this. We talked about this in Body yeah. Trust. That ability to show up as yourself authentically in order to connect with other people is really true belonging. And so to find those people that you can be authentic with safely, like in community, and honors you as a person instead of like how you're conforming or fitting some some narrow standard of what is supposed to make you happy and and successful. Yeah. I mean it's just a completely different freeing experience. It's so liberating to be able to be you and show up as you um with others. Yeah. Know? And that to me is ultimately why I'm in this is because we all deserve to feel that we're able to show up as ourselves that we're able to bring all of ourselves right and and be safe to do that right you know there's so i the number one cause of suffering um that I see in so many folks that I chat with is that they're not able or they don't feel able to show up as they are, right? They're, they're expected to be different than who they are. Mm -hmm. And that is so harmful and so damaging to the self. And really at the end of the day, damaging to the world. Oh, completely. We right? need those voices. We need all of those voices that have been quieted because of perhaps shame or the isolation that comes with shame. Yeah. So I really think of that a big piece of this, and of course this is another um, body trust thing, is that is that building that shame resilience. Yeah. And part of doing that is to, to see, to accept what the world is really like out there, and also to tune in and to recognize that indeed I know about myself and I can learn to bit by bit small movement by small movement, learn to trust that actually I am indeed good and right and whole and worthy just as I am. And to yeah. be able to trust that, then you can create those boundaries, right? You can say, you can have internal boundaries as to what works with you, and then you can have the boundaries in order to work with other people. You know, you can say, this is my plate, and that's your plate, yeah. right? show up unapologetically and say i'm gonna eat on my plate and you you that's yours over yeah, there you totally can that and you can be unapologetic and you can show up i read um i read a quote i don't know whether it was on facebook or instagram and i can't even remember who posted it but it was talking about how um boundaries are um it's like it's like having a, having a house with doors 
right? So boundaries show folks where they can enter. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and it was talking about the difference between walls right. and, and boundaries, which I thought was a really kind of cool way of um, articulating the difference between the two, right? Because walls just let nothing in. Right. Right? But if you have they don't boundaries. Let yourself out either. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They don't let you out either. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's the, the saying, you know, good fences make good neighbors. I mean, there's something to be true with that. But in all of those visuals, and when I even think of like, you know, when you're in your, you've got, you're protecting your realm, right? And you picture like these big ancient old stone walls or like the wall of China or something like that, right? But really, truly, I think that boundaries are a lot more fluid yeah. and they're ever changing and they can change based on the situation. They can change based on your mood. Yeah. So I think to be able to have some flexibility with your boundaries as well is is an important is an important piece to know that and to know that of others too, right? Mm -hmm. That sometimes absolutely um, because, because relationships are always fluid, mm -hmm. right? Like things are always changing. And I think one one thing that um, you know certain certain personality types can lean towards is you know wanting things to be to be certain to be concrete you know and i tend to operate that way myself you know and it takes a lot of awareness for me to remind myself that oh yeah today's actually a different day yeah right like i'm not going to feel the same today as i did yesterday and that's normal that's 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 normal it's not weird it's normal oh change right you know from hour to hour you know you can change conversation to conversation yes. i had a client yesterday who was talking about how her um her husband had communicated to her that he wanted her to lose weight yeah and she was going down that sort of thing and and she did find intuitive eating and come in and we worked together and eventually with learning more about what is going on eventually she was able to say you know what that crossed a line for me yeah. you know that crosses a line and so to be able to trust that you know what that's not okay for me and then to be able to communicate that to her husband and then that has now she's able to be more um true to herself yeah absolutely and yeah, yeah. So I think the boundaries change and the boundaries more a bit too. They're they're yeah. more fluid. Absolutely. It's like, how do you know what your needs are? And I think a lot of us, and I, well, a lot of my clients that come in, they're really cut off from their body needs. Right. right? There, there's it's like construction zone happening here. And so one of the skills that we work on is learning to you know dive in and you know i kind of think of it like having a headlamp on like we're going spelunking like okay let's let's go in and see yeah, what's yeah. Going on there you know but you do have to be cautious about that because there's a lot of times people who have experienced you know trauma with a capital t or a little t like they talk about um it's important to be aware of that and how people who have actually tried to leave their body or are not they don't perhaps feel safe in their body. You have to approach that. But what we're working toward is, is to be able to inhabit the body and to be able to experience your body from the inside instead of from the outside, right? Instead of that sort of your body as an object or an ornament, right? Experiencing the body from the inside um, as an instrument, right? So actually doing some practices of getting in you know i usually start people off with that with a heart rate meditation because they don't it's kind of you have to listen but you're you don't really know exactly how it's going to show up what you're listening for you know we'll do body scans a lot of ways of actually learning to inhabit the body and getting more familiar with subtle cues subtle yeah. cues you know and 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 to be able to recognize, oh, that's real. Like my body's telling me. It's like you know, when we tell, when we can tell we have to go to the bathroom, we don't like question that. We just like no. go, and then we don't question, did I pee enough? Did I not pee enough? Did, did I go as much as the person in the stall next to me or whatever? We just do it. So yeah. learning what those what those cues are coming from our body, learning what these sensations are in our body, 
the ones that arise from our body and in being able to discern the ones that arise in our mind mm -hmm. and show up in our body, like perhaps anxiety and where that shows up versus hunger and how that shows up differently and all the way these things show up and just really getting in tune with that. And I think that's just a really big skill piece. And when people learn to, to listen and start hearing their message, um, they can learn to trust it. And then as they start honoring that, their body learns to trust them. Yeah, well, totally right. It's a relationship, it's a two way street. Yeah, absolutely. Something that I really wanted to touch on um, briefly, we've got a few minutes left, <laughs> is, I know, it literally flies by, it's crazy, um, is something that I am new to, uh, well, re relatively new to exploring, um, I would say over the last kind of uh, for four years it's become um, something that's at the forefront of my practice in in this work um, is what's that I think I'm gonna like this I'm totally <laughs> guessing what it, yes say it, say it. it's pleasure yes yes and, and so I like I'm very heavily like brought up in a Protestant work ethic mm -hmm. Um, which has like, I'm sure taken years off of my life. Um, and also, you know, it's like this idea that we, we, we are always saving for tomorrow. Right. And, and like the, the play is allowed when the work is done and then it's like tomorrow never comes and the work is never done. And you know, there's been a huge, I, I now for me, like pleasure is my compass. I'm like, does something feel good? Okay, I'm walking towards it. Yes. Right. Yes. And it's really also helped me to learn, okay, that feels good. And then that, so that doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's also helped me in determining some of my boundaries as yes. well. And yes. finding needs that I didn't really know I had, like from like pleasure is now like, fun is now a core value of mine, right? Because if we're not doing it these things it, living, right, then it's, it's, it does feel hopeless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so I wonder, yeah, I don't know if you have anything to, to add, expand. I know we've had tons of conversations about this. Yeah. I mean, I just, this is such a big deal. I, I remember one client who she grew up, her family had a restaurant and she, they were never allowed to play on the weekends until the coleslaw was made. <laughs> right, right. It's like, you have to make the coleslaw first. And this, yes, the concept of pleasure and how it can be informative. And that is too that, you know, can you give yourself a permission slip? Can you allow pleasure? And then um, that is in one way how, we, how we're able to honor our needs. Um, is to be able to tell that pleasure and to allow that pleasure. That is, it is such a huge topic. I know, and, and you had Dawn Sarah on and she's yes. so awesome. So awesome. With that topic, but it is such a juicy topic because so often people don't, um, there's just- It's so like a luxury, right? Like we treat it as a luxury. We treat it as indulgence, guilty yeah. pleasure. Yes. You know, when it's necessary for survival and thriving yeah. yeah so much and creating the boundaries and knowing it to be true yes. and also knowing that sometimes pleasure isn't immediate right sometimes yes. sometimes self-care doesn't feel good but in the moment but it is something that we can do so if we can sit with it mindfully and we can recognize oh yeah going to the dentist maybe doesn't feel like pleasure but it actually like does feel good to be taking care of myself in that way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. and to feel feel good knowing that, you know, these bones that we want us to last as long as they can, maybe, you know, we've taken steps to to help that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Pleasure and, and self care and just all of these ways of of figuring out what our needs are. I just love it. There was that quote the, the quote about our boundaries. Did you want to read that? The quote about our boundaries? The one from Maintain Your Sovereignty as a way of 
you know, maintain your sovereignty, reign supreme over your body, your plates, your path, your timeline. Remember and reclaim what has been lost and fiercely guard the boundaries of your realm. Find warrior allies to help you should a threat arise and let the strength of your dominion empower others to stand their sacred ground too. And that talks about community, finding those warrior allies. And I know I have found one in you, Dana. I have found one in our body trust cohort. I have found one in other people who have this same philosophy that all bodies are worthy and that um, you know we have needs, we get to meet those needs and everybody has their own and they get to meet their own. It's, yeah. There's you so much power to be seen and yeah. see one another, right? Take off our armor and actually be, be with. Yes. Yes. It's such a beautiful way of connecting with others so much. So I love what you're doing with all of this. I just think you're awesome and it's so fun to talk. And I think, I mean, I could talk a whole lot longer. We didn't even talk about self-compassion. No, I know. I, know. <laughs> I mean, there's so much. To be continued. Yeah. But yeah. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you for sharing that quote because I did totally forget that I wanted to read that. And that um, quote was written by you. And I love it. I shared it on Instagram and Facebook. Um, it just, every single time I, I read it or I hear it, I get full body goosebumps. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's, it's rebellious. It's revolutionary to do that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's talk again. And if and I'm going to just put myself out there, I'm mindful food in motion. And find me on Instagram and Facebook. And I'm really trying to do a lot of one on one stuff. I do intuitive eating classes. I hold groups. Um, I see people one on one. And I'm I'm hopefully going to be do, doing more writing. I'm going to do Melissa Toller's course. Like yes, I'm doing it right now. I know. It sounds fantastic. Yeah, it's awesome. But I would love to connect with people too. And so amazing. And so your website is mindfulfoodinmotion.com. You can get to it from there. It's actually mfmnutrition.com. I had an intern that was like, you don't even know what it's, you know, she saw yeah. my whole website. Thank goodness. Bless her heart. She was so helpful to me. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then, yes, Facebook and Instagram. And you do also do um, uh, online work as yeah. well, right? Yeah. Perfect. So folks can find you. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me and thanks for tuning in, everyone. We'll be here next week um, for the um, third and um, last session for October with another dear friend of ours, Sarah Thompson, fellow body truster as well in Portland, Oregon. Um, and um, noon Eastern Standard Time, as usual. For a little break, pause from diet culture and body shaming bullshit. Hey, we actually didn't swear that much today. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and you can find the replays on the Facebook event page, the Hump Day Hiatus, also on my YouTube channel, Reclaiming the Wilds. Um, for updates and info, like my Facebook page to be able to tune in. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye, Dana. Love you. Bye. Love you. <laughs>